How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 10th video on the channel, and today we're going to be looking at the appendices to the sections on diachronic and synchronic linguistics in Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics. The video today is going to be fairly short, since the appendices aren't composed of chapters, but rather only three small subsections. The first is titled Subjective and Objective Analysis. Here, he seeks to divide between the two. Defining them, he says that subjective analysis is the analysis constantly made by users of a certain language, whilst objective analysis is that of linguists and grammarians, based heavily in history. An example of the differences produced by the division between objective and subjective analyses can be seen in the example of Greek hippos, as always apologize for my pronunciation. The grammarian carrying out an objective analysis might split it into three. The root, hip, the suffix, o, and an ending, s. On the contrary, a regular speaker carrying out a subjective analysis might think of it as being composed of only two parts, hip and os. Often, those who carry out objective analyses look down upon subjective ones, seeing them as mistaken and wrong. However, as Saussure states, the truth is that subjective analysis is no more false than analogy. Language never errs, it simply takes a different viewpoint. His main point is that neither analysis is without value. Both are valid in Saussure's eyes. However, at the end of the day, subjective analysis actually matters more, since it is based on the lived experience of language. Additionally, in a way, historical analysis, in other words objective analysis, is simply a modified form of subjective analysis. Saussure defines it as consisting of projecting the constructions of different periods on a single plane. It's just like spontaneous subjective analysis that it attempts to identify the subunits for make-up terms, but differs in that it synthesizes parts from across time, reaching towards the oldest one. In other words, it splits apart words into their most ancient subunits. To demonstrate what he means, Saussure offers the metaphor of words being like houses, where the arrangement of a room has been shifted a few times throughout its history. Objective analysis looks at how it was rearranged, where subjective analysis, being carried out by the current inhabitants of the house, simply exist within the current arrangement. Through understanding this distinction, Saussure says that we are able to resolve a methodological problem between Franz Bopp's school of linguistics and that of the neo-grammarians. The first acted as uh, almost as if Greek had simply come into the world with a list of subunits, like suffixes, to create words, whilst the second reacted against them and focused on the idea that we must observe what happens in the everyday speech of present-day languages. Saussure holds that both are valid at the same time. One mustn't be sacrificed for the other. Summing up, he says this. Objective analysis, which is intimately linked to subjective analysis of the living language, has a definite and rightful place in linguistic methodology. This takes us to the next subsection, titled Subjective Analysis and the Defining of Subunits. His goal with this section is to show that in analysis we only set up a method and definitions after we have adopted a synchronic viewpoint. Saussure so offers up a list of examples of word parts to explain what he means such as prefixes, roots, radicals, suffixes, and inflectional endings. He begins with inflectional endings. He defines them by saying this. The word final variable element that distinguishes the different forms of a noun or verb paradigm. For example, in Czech, you have the nominative form žena, meaning woman, and the accusative form ženu. The inflectional ending in the latter is that of u. Through getting rid of the inflectional ending, we get to what he calls the inflectional theme, or radical. This is generally the element common to a group of related words. An example is the phoneme roule in French, which is common to roulage, meaning roller, roulement, meaning rolling, and rouleau, or rolling pin. In spontaneous or subjective analysis, speakers can often single out different types or grades of radical. First grade radicals are those which can be reduced down further, while second grade radicals are those which result from that operation or which are extended through things like suffixes. This brings us to roots. This is the element common to all words in a family which cannot be divided further. Since synchronic subjective analysis is only interested in the meaning of units, 
Roots thus represent in this framework the point where meaning is at its most abstract, since it has to be applicable to a myriad of terms that contain it. This connects to radicals, since the more they are shortened and decomposed, the more they are abstracted. In Saussure's view, the root is a reality in the mind of speakers, although it's not always correctly identified. It goes back now to alternation, which we looked at a couple of videos ago during the first half of diachronic linguistics. In his estimation, alternations, particularly between vowels, generally strengthen our feelings of roots and subunits. This is due to the regularity of alternation, which leads to roots becoming more distinct. He now moves to prefixes and suffixes. He defines a prefix as being added on to the part of the word defined as a radical, while suffixes are used to turn roots into radicals or first-order radicals into second-order ones. Interestingly, suffixes can also be zero, as in absent. Sometimes, suffixes contain semantic information or meaning, like the suffix te in English, which forms agents, like in the case of writer or waiter. Other times, it fulfills a grammatical role, such as expressing that something is occurring in the present. However, oftentimes it means nothing by itself. Going on to prefixes, they differ from suffixes in that the prefix is more easily separated from the word as a whole, such as in the case of re in redo. However, this rule is only general, not absolute. This isn't the case for all words. Additionally, quite a few prefixes act as words in their own right, like counter in counterpoint. Moving now back to radicals and the relationship with suffixes, the former do not make sense without the latter. They don't form standalone words. For example, take the word organization. Organi means nothing. It requires its suffix sation. The same is true of suffixes. That sation is meaningless by itself. The result is that speakers are able, even if they aren't consciously aware of it, to delineate the radical from the prefix tacked onto it, whereas the same can't be said of suffixes. He ends the section by stating this. Subjectively, suffixes and radicals derive their value solely from syntagmatic and associative oppositions. This takes us to the last subsection, etymology. His main point here is that etymology is not a distinct discipline in linguistics, nor a subdivision of evolutionary linguistics. Rather, to Saussure, it is the application of certain diachronic and synchronic principles. In his words, It goes back into the history of words until it finds something to explain them. We have to be careful when we say that a certain term comes from another, earlier one, since this can imply a multitude of different things, such as a change in sound, a shift in meaning, a change in both, or even a derivation, like French pommier or apple tree from pomme, meaning apple. Etymology is diachronic in that it deals with different forms through time, and synchronic in that it requires comparisons in certain language states to get a full picture. His main takeaway is this. Etymology does not simply explain isolated words and stop there. It compiles the history of word families and of families of formative elements, prefixes, suffixes, etc. This concludes Appendices to Parts 3 and 4 from Ferdinand de Saussure's course in General Linguistics. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong, please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better. Next time, we'll look at the section on Geographical Linguistics. Until then, bye!